Chapter 20 of The Mandalorian has arrived. What an episode. Not only do we spend time with the Kova on their hidden planet, and we get to work with Mandalorians being badasses, as they should, but we also learn more about the past life of Grogu during the Jedi Order, specifically during Order 66 and the Fall of the Republic. There are some fantastic scenes here and a lot of information to unpack and discuss. Therefore, you want to hit the subscribe button, as we'll be doing a lot of breakdowns this coming week. Tired of Foundling, Episode 4 of the third season is directed by Carl Weathers and written by both Jon Favreau and Dave Filoni. We're over halfway through this season of The Mandalorian, and I think the final moments of this episode make it clear what direction we're going in. Specifically, what direction the character of Bo-Katan is going in. Let's explore more. Remember, spoiler alert, this is a full review of The Mandalorian Chapter 20. Turn away now, roll the intro. Katie Sackhoff continues to excel in the role of Bo-Katan. The actress was born to play this role. However, character development-wise, we see where she is going. Katan is working closer and closer with the Mandalorian Covert and Din Djarin. At the end of last episode, we see her stare at the Mithrasaur symbol on the wall. At the end of this episode, we see her ask the armorer about seeing a Mithrasaur. Evidently, the armorer, who is a little superstitious anyway and set in her ways, does not believe Katan has seen this and thinks it's a vision. In another interesting detail, some Star Wars fans have pointed out that every episode of The Mandalorian Season 3 seems to end on Bo-Katan. This is an interesting detail. As viewers, I think it's obvious to us now that this season is setting up Bo-Katan to take control of the Mithrasaur and unite the Mandalorian clans. We'll see her having the backing of Din Djarin's clan, then likely meet others and unite them under the symbol of the Darksaber and the Mithrasaur hid on Mandalore. Also, I've got to ask this as it just stuck out to me, why is Bo-Katan driving a clown car of a Mandalorian ship? No seriously, how do we fit the Mandalorian strike force, herself, Din Djarin, the rescued foundling, Paz Vizsla, and then three alien birds into the cargo hold? <laughs> like seriously, it's a weird one. Anyway, seeing how respected Bo has become by the clan is great. She's found her people again. We see this during one of the opening scenes, where she observes everyone training on the beachfront. In Season 1 of The Mandalorian, the Armour's Forge gave Din Djarin flashbacks to when Death Watch saved him as a kid from the Clone Wars. While the Armour makes a roundel for Grogu, a similar thing happens. The Armour does describe a forge as the heart of Mandalorian culture, and there is a symbolic representation between Armour being forged and a Mandalorian being forged. The trials are best us in our life are which makes us stronger. That's a good quote there. This time it is Grogu having a flashback to his past, and the events during the Siege of the Jedi Temple during Order 66. We have wondered since Episode 1 of The Mandalorian how Grogu survived the Purge and who saved him, and after many fan theories later, we now find out that it was Jedi Master Kelleron Beck who saved Grogu. It's amazing to see. Kelleron Beck is played by Ahmed Best, who previously played Jar Jar Binks during a prequel trilogy. He was cast as the Jedi Master Kelleron Beck for the kids show Jedi Temple Challenge, where he trained younglings, which were kids who do jungle run style challenges, and I recommend giving it a watch, it's kind of fun. So to now have Beck coming into the actual story of the Star Wars universe, and being the one who saves Grogu from the Jedi Temple, is really wild and super cool. Beck is skilled with a lightsaber, and even dual wields too to take down numerous clone troopers at the Jedi Temple. I mean his nickname is the Sabred Hand. We get a really cool speeder chase through Coruscant, where I'm sure so many people die from LATs just firing at Beck and hitting random apartment buildings. Imagine living there. The duo flee the planet with the aid of Naboo forces, which is interesting, and we'll talk more about this at a later date. We still don't know how Grogu ends up in Avala 7, but I suppose we'll get more of that story later on in the Star Wars universe. While these scenes are good, I do think we've seen too much of Order 66 lately. It's a bit too much. Sure, it's fantastic to explore this area of the Star Wars galaxy and story, because ultimately, so many Jedi and people were affected by Order 66 and the Great Jedi Purge. However, we keep seeing some of these scenes repeated. Thankfully, it seems we might not go down this route now. Over will expand Grogu's past and learn why the Jedi were so keen to get Grogu off of Coruscant and away from the Empire, apart from the obvious reason. While watching this episode, I realised the armour is a bit of a jerk to Grogu. Now I am kind of joking here, but she could have just given them a lift to when she informs the young Force user, there is much to learn, and then walks off. Grogu walks like 5 centimetres an hour, lady. She kind of just fucks off and just takes ages to get there. I mean, it's just funny, and I thought it was funny, okay? Just leave it be. 
And if it has to be said, the armor is very equal to Grogu. This child isn't human, but she still honors them because he is a foundling. For all intents and purposes, Grogu is a Mandalorian and respected as such. It was really good to see the armor actually doing a bit more in this episode, rather than just waffling for a change. She does meet with a strike team on the Gornet fighter and works in more socially than before. Though, part of me still wonders if we'll ever learn more about this mysterious individual. Many fan theories rage about whether she is a former Mandalorian warrior before the Purge. One day we might find out, and I think it might be Rookcast, but I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm not hung up on that decision, to be fair. I don't know. Anyway, moving on. A good episode title has multiple meanings, and sums up the episode in one of a couple of words. This chapter titled The Foundling is a very good title, as it refers to not only Grogu, or even Ragnar, but also Bo-Katan. They are all essentially foundlings of this Mandalorian cult, and we see each rising to the occasion, apart from maybe Ragnar, but he was captured for most of the episode, we'll let him off. Grogu gets a lesson from the armorer, and manages to best Ragnar in a duel with darts. Bo-Katan understands how honorable these people are, and how she can find her place within them even if she might exploit them later by taming a Mithrasaur, which is a popular theory right now and one I will stand by. It's a Star Wars theory everyone! Overall this was an interesting episode of The Mandalorian. The episode was short, only half an hour in length compared to our longer previous couple of episodes, but there were some cool set pieces in this episode. From Beck and Grogu and a speed of chase across Coruscant to the Mandalorians chasing down the winged creature. It was also fantastic to see the Jedi Temple again on Coruscant. Part of me wondered if they dared show it in the previous episode, as we did see Dr. Pershing running around the planet set in the present day. However, with the winged creature, I have to question the Mandalorian's skill and intelligence. They have settled on this planet where they live in a cave system. However, all of the times we've seen them, they have been under attack and require the aid of others to help them. In the first episode of Season 3, they are attacked by a giant turtle-like creature from the water. Without Din appearing of his ship, more would have died there. Now we learn there are winged creatures who seemingly have taken foundlings before and live so far away they need bo ship in order to get it. And even then, it's Bo and Din who managed to defeat the creature with very little help from the other Mandalorians. I know they're main characters, essentially, if this is their job, but if these are other Mandalorians who can't land some blows, what good if it's Mandalorians, I'm just saying. Anyway, this episode was directed by Carl Weathers, actor for Grief Karga. I would have preferred it if Carl had directed an episode that has his character in, because I do always think that's cool when actors and directors do that. Apart from that, the direction of this episode is really good, giving some personal type moments with our characters, and overall, filling it out rather well. Alright, Exalt Ones, that's for myself. Don't forget that an episode of The Bad Batch also airs on Disney Plus today. You want to go and watch this one? It's kind of cool, I hear. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. To keep up to date with the latest stars, news, lore, and more. You can also follow us on social media as well, but let us know what you think in the video comment section below. Because if you're talking Star Wars, we want to hear about it. Okay, that's for myself. I've been Captain Jack here on Star Wars now. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends. Goodbye.